Week 7, top 40, fantasy football running back rankings. We are so back. That's it. Can't get more robotic than that. Can't get more SEO focused than mm. that shit right there, all right? <laughs> Jump right in. Top 12, Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Kyron Williams, Kenneth Walker, Joe Mixon. Let me stop you right there. All right, Dan. Well played. Joe Mixon. I did not think he was going to look like that. Holy off mother. Of the he high looks, ankle. I've never seen him look this good in his career. He never looked this good in Cincinnati. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> it's... He looks slim. He looks explode. He looks good. There's no... like come, I don't think I've seen any player coming off of a high ankle sprain look like that. Yeah. That was crazy. He looked awesome. I mean, that's what happens when you take six weeks to, to recover from it. I have defended this man with my life since Dynasty offseason. Good call. That's... I just I got this is, this is one I can hang my hat on. Ignore some of the other bad takes, but yeah. hang your hat on this. One. I just wanted to tip the cap and give the kid a highlight. He uh, appreciate you, you've been on Joe Mixon, and I was fighting you a little bit. Yeah, dude, he looks he looks lean. He looks explosive. He looks th- just well, the system there just feels a lot. We both uh, got him six this better. week, so that's the, exactly we're back on the same page. Back. All right, we got Bijan at six. We've got Tony Pollard at seven, and now Tajay Spears is is probably out the hamstring injury, so he takes way more of that backfield. I think that is a. Uh, a, a good ranking there is like a solidified RB1 for the time being. Alvin Kamara down at eight, probably a little bit lower than, uh, you know, the way he's performed, but their offense is banged up, weapons, quarterback, all that kind of stuff. So no disagreement there. Even we got Kamara's Brees Hall. a little bit banged up too, right? Yeah, he's been banged up for a couple of weeks, but like yeah, I don't think it's anything week, serious. That, you know. I'm kind of the same. I view it the same way where like he's been – I feel I feel like he's getting better in rest. Almost yeah. like the NBA a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um. Brees Hall at nine had the great showing on Monday Night Football. Now he plays at Pittsburgh, which they're pretty much the number one run defense in the NFL. So if Devontae Adams plays, maybe that helps and opens things up a little bit more. But regardless, you're playing Brees, you're playing DeMont, who we have at 10. Chuba Hubbard, 11. Josh Jacobs at 12. Uh, and then we jump into tier two. I will just say Chuba Hubbard, I think, is like, you know, you guys have him as a, as a running back one. I just don't know how high, like, there's no number I think you could tell me for Chuba right now that I would, like, disagree with in terms of, uh, how high you could have him in the rankings. He's been he's been great every single week, regardless of matchup, regardless of who they're playing against, regardless of game script. Washington just lost Jonathan Allen, one of their yep. best interior defenders of the last fucking you know five ten years or whatever. Uh, he's out for the season, so that already bad defense is getting even worse there. So Chuba, I feel like is just unreal right now. I, I have him in so many dynasty leagues because he was so attainable this year. Yeah, in the off season, even just recently, I got him for like third round pick. So it's kind of fun when you have a, a player like that who until recently you're looking at projections and you're like this is so low i feel like every week with him you're gonna i have a chance to smash the, the running back on the other side this week i'm thinking the rankings and projections for a lot of people might start getting uncomfortably high though dude just because the washington <clears throat> matchup yeah and like, like yeah it, I, i'm not saying i disagree i think he could go to the moon it's just you'll finally i think start to see people getting him into a really high range i think the the funny thing though is i feel like the projections are going to start mm. to peel back more than they should even more because now you're going to get the Jonathan Brooks is activated. He's he's practicing. and are They even opened like they opened up his window? To they practice? said that they're opening it this week. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like they've been saying that for weeks. Yep. Yeah, well, so they said they've been, they're have been they going to open it this week. So uh, with him being back at practice, throwing some stuff on, you know, the pads and all that stuff, he's going to – they're probably going to start uh, pulling Chuba's rankings down a little bit too yeah, much. You're, you're, well, you're definitely going to have a lot of that going on, but for now, for this week at least anyway. He's you're, another one where we were, we were just having a discussion off camera about how this year – like, obviously, hot takes always happen. Reactions to early season stuff always happens. This year in particular, it felt like there were so many guys who were just god-awful weeks one and two and some into three, and then all of a sudden, really not too much of a situation flip. I guess for Chuba, it's a little bit different because Andy Dalton did come in. But, like, Terry, even, like, Cooper comes to mind. Chuba was god-awful, like, week one, and then everyone was, like, off of him that everything just flipped and they turned into and, and I love that because like Chuba I think is my highest drafted player in underdog drafts this year yeah. it was the opportunity after week one I was like fuck what a waste I of dropped day. Chuba after week one in my home league oh. and then I picked him up going into the week two waiver wire again just like ah there really isn't anybody else out here yet that I like let me get Chuba again yeah. save my ass <laughs> so the thing is like uh you finally at least got to see the reason I was so excited was because of the way they brought in Canales and the way he was talking about, and then obviously what that signing in Robert Hunt, everything they said was that they wanted to run the football and all the, you know, transactions matched that. So you were excited for it, but then with Bryce Young at the helm, the first couple weeks was like, this offense is woke. Deontay Johnson, yeah. Like, it's all, it was all just such a quick uh, flip to all of them, but let's not waste any more time on Mr. Facts. Mr. Hubbard out there. He's in your lineup. Josh Jacobs is 12. Now we move into the 13 to 24 range. So the RB2s. Jonathan Taylor here. Um, I mean, it's, Obviously, a big discrepancy. This is just 
has to be injury related. Yep. Yeah, a hundred percent. Are you expecting him to play? I'm expecting him to play. You are, um, okay. yeah. And if he plays, I am going right back to him being one of the best running backs in football. I have him as number four if he plays. I know it's uh again that high ankle. Yeah, you know we're having the same argument we had about Joe Mixon. Miami's defense is not good uh, when it comes to running back position. They've been giving up a lot of points so far this year, and that's really just because Tyler Huntley is not keeping them in game. So in the second half, you're allowed to yeah. run the football a lot. I think uh, they'll lean on Jonathan Taylor if he's healthy, if he's playing. He's a guy that I'm plugging into my lineup with ultimate confidence. And obviously, if he's not playing, who cares? Yeah, well, I'm, my 23 is more so like uh, with the high ankle, I could see them giving him a couple more weeks on ice, similar to Mixon. But yeah. if there, if he's playing, there, there's no world in which I'm even close to 23 with him playing uh, in this Miami matchup. I think I think they, they need uh, Jonathan Taylor back in this offense. Sure. I just don't know if they're going to rush him. Yeah, if I had to guess, I think it's one of those where they start to get real close. Like maybe he goes DMP, limited, limited, and then they're like, game time decision, It was going to be ruled out. Yeah. Mix in the week before where he was like limited, limited, and then it – Game time, out. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably what ends up happening with JT. But obviously, if he's playing, he's probably going to be in your lineups. Then we have Jameer Gibbs at 14, Brian Robinson at 15. I will say, B-Rob, this is like the ultimate, ultimate matchup. Smash, Crazy. smash. Now, <clears throat> the injury is a little bit difficult because he didn't really practice last week. He was like supposed to be a game time decision. Then he got downgraded at the end of the week to DMP, which doesn't feel great right now. Yeah. Um, If he was healthy... I would have Brian Robinson possibly as a top five back this week. I would. Carolina matchup. Yeah. It, the, the matchup is just beautiful with that banged up Carolina defense. Look at what, look at what, look Algier at what just and Bijan just both did. That's what I'm saying. They, they, that, this run defense in Carolina is like paper as paper could be. Yeah. So on, on my channel, I do must start and must sit players at the end of the week. Usually like Fridays is when those videos come out. Yeah. And I've been waiting because Brian Robinson is my start of the week at the running back position if, more good information comes out. Yeah, I think we need to get him back at practice relatively soon to see what's going on with him. Um, I, it sucks, too, because they don't really have, like, another... Like, Eckler's good for what he is, but they're not going to bang up the middle. I think the game plan goes so in favor of Washington if B-Rob plays, because you can give him 20-plus carries. And, like, we saw what Algier just went over, you know, uh, went over 100 yards, a touchdown. B-Rob's a better He's player than Algier. Two, like, right, like, this yeah. is... The matchup of matchups. Yep. The other thing with him, like, I mean, 15, it felt like I could not go any lower, and I would not. Um, but it, the week prior, he played Cleveland, and he got in the end zone twice, but was, like, very sparingly used. So I'm, I'm honestly wondering, even if he's playing, like, how much they're going to use him again. That, that makes me a little bit nervous, too, where it was like he didn't – he was coming back from the injury, or he's, like, kind of on a short week because he didn't practice much. And they're like, ah, maybe he's going to play. Played, fantasy-wise, fine, because the touchdowns didn't play much then didn't play the next week. So it's like he probably had a setback, and yeah. I'm like, ah, that's what scares me a little bit. So even if you own B-Rob, I guess it's kind of scary throwing him into your lineup, not knowing how how like strong he really is right now. Right. We got JK at 16. We got Kareem Hunt at 17. So we got a five-spot difference there. Going against San Francisco, uh, Adam, you got 14. Andrew, you got him down at 19. He's coming off of a really big game, obviously. I think he had 28 touches prior to the bye week. Now, no change in the backfield. Like Carson Steele's been completely phased out. Samaj Piran is just whatever. It's Kareem Hunt's backfield at this point, and he's looked good. They feel super comfortable with him. Um, I mean, if you have him at 19, there's, there's definitely worlds where you are – not playing him or he's like a debating a, a debatable flex play because obviously there are a lot of really good receivers in the top 24 or 30 or whatever um are you like concerned about hunt in the matchup or something no i'm not necessarily concerned about hunt and, and honestly i feel like maybe it was just more so he found his way going down a little bit because i like some of the other plays around him um i, I like ramondre stevenson's matchup this week against jacksonville he got the nod over hunt like things like that uh, so he kind of felt, found his way down there. Obviously, you know, that defensive line there in San Francisco is a pretty good defensive line, but he's going to be a fine play. Like, I, I'm more than comfortable throwing him in there as my RB2 this week and, and not really worrying too much about it. But I think it was just more so the other guys around him. I just leaned their way. Okay. And then the next guy, Devon A. Chan, another big split here. Adam, you have him a lot higher here at 16. Andrew, you're all the way down at... Uh, 24. 24, yeah. And A. Chan, like, it obviously has looked horrendous with Snoop Huntley under center. You know, we could talk about the Tyree Kill stuff, which we talked about in the receiver episode, which is on the channel from earlier, where Tyree Kill is like a, a really scary start right now. Anyone in that offense really is. We have Mostert coming back, playing really well last week. We have Jalen Wright, who looked good as well. So, A-Chan coming off the concussion, assuming that he's going to be healthy for this week, does he assume a lead back role? And if so, if not, like the split backfield concerns me a little bit right now. 
Yeah, I think for me it is it is that. It's split backfield. On paper, this is a great matchup for HN, but uh, all of those guys are, are going to probably see some touches. And I just, I'm really pessimistic on any Miami option. I think I've kind of come across that way in some of the other episodes. And it's just really until Tua gets back in the lineup, I really don't want to play these options. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly get it. Um, and maybe it's because I do own him some, but I, I think I'm, I'm looking at it, what they want to do. If you're coming out of the bye, you, I would think, start to try to establish getting your best players the football when you're not playing well. Um, that's one of the big things. And I think you mentioned in the wide receiver video how also with your quarterback play, you probably want to get guys the ball quickly and not have to have, you know, your quarterback Snoop Huntley just uh, – taking long dropbacks and pushing the ball downfield. I think I think Devon A. Chain is in for a big workload. I think you're right. If if it's a split backfield, this is that in this offense, that's horrible. But I, I'm pretty optimistic that they're gonna try to get a heavy dosage of uh, A chain early in this matchup. Yeah, I just um I follow some Dolphins beat reporters and they're like really, really bullish on Raheem Mostert. They just they keep bringing up how this offense runs differently when he's not there and how they so badly want to use Mostert as like the bully back and the inside, the tackles back, which, you know, agree with it, don't agree with it, whatever. I, I kind of feel like there's some real credence to that statement after last week. Like they just can play differently when they have a guy that like defenses have to respect the middle of the field and, and the run game up the middle. Whereas like HN, uh, he's a good in between the tackles runner for sure. But like most of the game plan they have for HN is getting, getting him out in space on, you know, uh, handoffs outside or screens or whatnot. It makes me wonder why that beginning of this the year was so bad for Mostert because he was like droppable in yeah. fantasy at the beginning of the year. Yeah, um, maybe it's a little bit of like the offensive line needing to mesh because they were they were horrible early on and they still might be. And maybe last week's game was still you know against the Patriots where you could just bully them and that's a one week blip. But I but I think for me it's it makes me more nervous from like a game plan perspective than it does maybe actual like productive. Sure. Yeah, and we just. Talked about earlier with Chuba. I mean, they got their beneficiary of Robert Hunt, who was awesome for Miami. You lose a guy like that in the middle, yeah. it's massive. Yeah, mm-hmm. agree. Um, all right, let's keep moving down here. We got James Conner at 19. He's dealing with, I think, like a minor ankle injury, possibly. Yeah. I haven't start- seen any injury reports. I'm not overly concerned, but it's starting to feel like... It's very hush What do you? How do you say it? Like, Conner's always... Every year, he's always missed at least a couple games. Yeah. And... I don't think this one's serious, but it's one of those where, like, when you continue to give a guy like him, who is a workhorse, all those touches, and you start to see the injury report, you're like, oh, that thing in the back of your mind. Like, Trey Benson has looked terrible for the record. Yeah. So the the worry of him stealing the job outright is not there, but is James Conner, how serious is the injury? And to your point, it seems very hush-hush. Yeah, it we got very- Conner a little bit banged up. Obviously, uh, you know, bad game last week. He left, and then DeMarcado and Trey Benson split work. They got a really tough matchup against the Chargers, so – I think I'm kind of in the same boat as you guys. He's like a mid to low end RB2, depending on the health here. Jordan Mason. So you guys have him, you guys have him down at 20. He's a dude that was like week over week over week, a top five back in the beginning of the season. Yeah. Now we've seen those numbers come down a little bit because he's getting borderline no passing work and they're having a lot of trouble scoring in the red zone, which is usually him. He's getting goal line carries, but like he's not converting them. Kansas City's obviously a really tough run defense. Number one. Um, if Jordan Mason, I, the shoulder injury does not seem to be overly serious. I think worst case, he'll not play this game. But even then, I kind of feel like it's probably leaning towards him playing. And if he's playing, I think he shoulders the majority of the work. So I think, uh, I think I would go a little bit higher on Mason here, just based on what we've seen. And like, regardless of matchup, we've seen this running game function at a high level, uh, you know, regardless because of the system. My, my 20 is a little reflective of... You know, watching that game and seeing how he didn't come back in, I, I think he if he ends up playing, like if I know that he's healthy, he probably will move up to about 15 for me. Um, I'm a little pessimistic that he for sure plays this week. I'm not overly concerned long, big picture, you know, long term, but I don't know. I'm a little concerned that, that he's 100% ready to go this week. And if, if CMC is really not, not anywhere near ready to come back, if that's the case there, they might not rush him one week if, they, if he needs a little time. Maybe. I, uh, I hate the matchup. I absolutely hate the matchup. Like, I think a lot of this is the matchup for me, plus you bake in the fact that he has the little bit of the shoulder injury that he did, you know, come take one more carry in the second half and say, ah, that, That's, you know, that hurt. Does that, does that to me, that that is, like, not a good thing. Yeah, that he comes back in and is like, ooh, this hurts, I can't go back. Yeah. And, and I'm also a little bit worried, just tiny bit, of – Maybe he's opened the door for Grendo to take a couple more touches. Yeah. Maybe he's opened the door for a guy like uh, Patrick Taylor to come take a couple more touches because Taylor was out there a lot uh, sure. in the second half. So I'm, I don't know. I, I really liked 
what Jordan Mason was doing at the beginning of the year, and I have him in one of my leagues. I'm starting to cool on him rapidly. Yeah, for sure. Tony offered me Jordan Mason for uh, T. Higgins, and I'm like, in a full PPR league, rest of the season I'm taking T. Higgins there, Tony, even, in, even in a league where I need a running back. Tony offered me Jordan Mason for DeAndre Swift and, and Brandon Ayuk. And so he just messed really? up. And I, Recently? I, yesterday. Or two days ago, and I yeah, told he's him, trying to get out of me. I said, "Brother, I, I ain't doing this he, shit." Yeah. He, he mass That's crazy. He yeah. mass offered Jordan Mason, and I, I got a trade uh, straight up for Mike Evans, and I was like, "Nah." And I that makes me think he must have just that day been like, "Everybody's getting a Mason trade." Yeah. Here and and for the record, I don't think that offer from him was that crazy. Get Mason for <laughs> T Higgins straight up, like Mason is a dude who's produced at a really high level so far this year. But again, he just doesn't catch passes, and the closer we get to like week ten, week eleven, the more likelihood we're going to see C Mac come back. The, yeah. the, there's two things in general. Yeah, the C-Mac thing, and I think you just look at Mason and what happened to him, whether he's playing this week or not. I think it's easy in the season early on. You'll see running backs because everybody's typically healthy early, like smashing. You get, okay, I got to get all these running backs. And then every week you start to realize, like, this position takes Long, a brutal, longevity brutal, is a talent, bro. brutal, like, it's yeah. a brutal sport, man. It's, the, it's like kind of like when, when, yeah, when people start off hot, like, if you – like a player in the summer, or dislike a player in the summer. The way people react after week one, it, it's as if all your videos from June to August Don't were play. DFS week one predictions. I'm like, fam, that's not how we're playing this game. So, like, if you didn't like a player long term, it's for reasons of like, I don't think that he's going to be able to be this back for the course of the season. And listen, D Jordan Mason can bounce back and be great, but that is like such uh, uh, an important part of analyzing running backs is like, you have to be talented enough to be able to shoulder the workload week over week over week over week. And that's not an easy thing to do. If you've never done it before, it's your first time going through like preparing your body for a long season. Like you don't know how you need to prepare. You don't know if you need to take ice baths every day. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's a different process to it where if you're a dude like David Montgomery, you've been through 280 touches for six straight years. Like you know how to take care of your body at this point. Whereas like Jordan Mason, this is his first year, probably over like 70 touches. Somebody said in the comments a couple, a couple weeks back, they said, these guys must be the biggest David Montgomery fans because we bring him up on every episode. We talk about David Montgomery. Why wouldn't we? Bro's a dog, man. Yeah. I'm He's sorry. a fucking beast. <laughs> but apparently, I'm, I'm sorry. I like I like good fantasy players. Apparently, so we're Monty's number one fan club. So, good. Monty, I mean, if that's a fucking hit for us, then if David Monty wants to come on the show, we can. We have a seat right here. Be fire. Everybody's trying to buy him this week. Uh, yeah. So Jordan Mason, a little bit down on Ramondre at 21. Uh, we don't really have a status on his injury yet he obviously missed this week but gets a much better matchup against uh jacksonville much better he he is such an interesting case right now for me yeah i was i was He's a perfect example of that we're like week one and two everyone's like you were so wrong and i'm like yeah, yeah but over the course of the season i don't think i'm gonna we can, we can. i like him more with may though sure of, of course yeah. i think a uh, whole offense you have to be higher on like i was early on the usage he got the first three weeks i mean I think I even said he's looking bell like a modern-day bell cow. And but also it was Gibson, immediately, Gibson was hurt. And immediately after that. I'm going to give you the handshake on that one. I've used that more than once, I will admit. W. Modern-day bell cow. Unfortunately, Stevenson, uh, shortly after, didn't look good. And then they said that Gibson was going to be the starter, right? And then the crazy part is <laughs> that almost put like a lit a fire under his ass because that week that Gibson was going to be the starter and people really yeah. – like right before the game, uh, I always look at percentage of plays – uh, like players that are being started in lineups. Yes. Gibson, you'd be shocked. It was like something like plus 20%. Yeah. So I don't even know how often he was owned, let alone people are like, hey, let's start him. Ramondre goes out and has a great week, but then now he's out this week. Yeah. So did he, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel confident that he's going to play, honestly, in this game. I, he, maybe he end up will, and I, at that point I'd probably move him up a little if bit. If he does, if he's active, where are you going to put him? You have him at 27 right yeah, now. Yeah, I think, I think I'm having conversations right in this – Definitely ahead of some of the guys I have right now where it's like, I think him or Mason with the matchup, if you tell me he's healthy versus Jacksonville, I, I'd probably play him. Yeah, I'd probably put him right. around 16. Yeah. Okay. Yep. How about you? Um, I don't know that I'd go that high. Like, I, I think I'd still play Mason. If, if both are active, I'd probably play Mason, but he wouldn't be very far behind. The reason I, I guess, let me give you a little more context to that because um, also Gibson then this with this week. So he was the, named the starter two weeks ago. Rhino came out and balled out. Last week, he was backfield to himself, absolute cone. So I feel like there's a scenario where if Ramondre is healthy, we could be locking him back into the old modern-day bell cow. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Um, Najee at 22, we'll keep moving down here. Aaron Jones at 23. So the Minnesota, Minnesota situation is a little bit difficult to uh, decipher right now. With Aaron Jones, 
I think there's a very good chance he misses this week. I yeah. do too. I, I really do. And yeah. and I made a point last week on a lot of the videos that I was making regarding the waiver wire that it was very under the radar to go grab Ty Chandler because it was not being talked about very heavily on waiver wire shows. I think especially because he had the bye week and so you had to stash him. I think Chandler gets to start this week. I do too. What do you think about your Vikings fan, the trade for Cam Akers? That pissed me the fuck off as someone who has Ty Chandler. Like, Cam Akers was there last year, so he knows the it's system. Annoying. He can play right away. He's been awful in Jacksonville, and I think he was pretty awful last year in Minnesota outside of, like, a, whatever, a couple runs or whatever. But, like, do you think – like, Ty Chandler was set up to be – if Aaron Jones is out, Ty Chandler was set up to be the RB1 probably. Now, I yes. actually think there's some, like, Cam Akers vibes to Ty Chandler and that he's not as that good of a running back relative to, like, Aaron Jones. Incredibly tough matchup versus the Detroit run defense. Obviously lost Aiden Hutchinson, so that's a big dip to this defensive yes. line. But break down, like, the way you're looking at the Minnesota run game for this this week. Yeah, I think they they bring in a guy like Cam Akers because they trust him. Uh, and it's they liked what they saw last year. Obviously, he got away in some free agency or whatever, but... You know, you make the move. I think where Cam Akers is going to benefit this Vikings offense this week if Aaron Jones is out, because I do expect Akers to be active and playing this week, mm. is he is a better pass protector than Chandler. Ty Chandler by by a significant margin. So I think wow. he's going to be playing in pass pro. Uh, Ty Chandler, he's probably going to get a lot of the work. He's more efficient as a runner. That's, that's what's going to happen. But I uh, definitely... I'm feeling worse about my Ty Chandler shares today sure. than I was a couple days ago, and that's because I do think that Cam Akers is going to come in and steal five, six, seven carries this Agreed. week. I feel like the sentiment on Twitter is like, ah, it doesn't matter. Cam Akers is a bum, and it won't affect Chandler. It's like, fam, it's going to affect Chandler. Yeah, Kevin O'Connell talks very highly about Cam Akers. Yeah, it, it's And it's they worked annoying. together when they were in Los Angeles as well. Yeah, good so. point there. Um, okay, so you guys have Aaron Jones like 23-24. Let's assume he's out. You have Chandler down at 34-35 in that range. Where does Ty Chandler jump up to? assuming Aaron Jones is out. Yeah, well, I think just in general on that point, the Cam Akers thing, um, I think it's also, while it's a long-term, they they believe in the talent. Like, they've literally traded for him, although the compensation was low, after two different Achilles tears. That's crazy. Most yeah. people don't yeah. even sign players after they, that. They traded for him last year. Right. Then he got away in free agency. Then they traded for him again. They're like, you can't get away from us. you got to yeah. stay here. But the thing about it, going back to last year's point, that was the medial, like the middle ground, I should say, between and getting in the way of the Ty Chandler break out at the end of the year yeah. and it's almost like that specific player again where they trust they basically entrusted him as the you know number two guy on the depth chart and then after he got hurt then Ty Chandler stepped up into that role so like that specific thing I think worries me for the splits with Ty Chandler like it worries me about one Aaron Jones's health right now that yeah it definitely sounds a little bit of an alarm on Aaron Jones I think if you, you don't make that move if you think he's gonna you know miss a game if you think it's you think two, it's more serious? So I had heard rumblings that they thought at the time it could be somewhere between two and six weeks, really? which would be insane if wow. that was the case. Okay. Now, obviously, that included the bye week, you know, being one of those weeks. So, you know, there's a chance it is just this week. But if he's still dealing with this hamstring injury, which keep in mind, Aaron Jones has had hamstring injuries a ton in the past, and they have sidelined him for long periods of time. So if that is the issue, and we're talking about three, four, five weeks where they are just going to give Cam Akers and Ty Chandler more touches. Maybe even Aaron Jones is active, but they're pulling that workload back quite a bit. It's going to be – it could get sketchy, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe the underlying story here too is like Aaron Jones has been so good, and this team is obviously in the playoff hunt immediately. Yeah. So whereas <clears throat> maybe last year, you know, in this type of situation, they're not going to uh, – they don't really care about, you know, winning games or pushing for the playoff scenario – Whereas this year, it's like we need, like, if we're going to make a run in the playoffs, it's going to be because of Aaron Jones being healthy. So maybe this part of the schedule, they're like, you know, we'll we'll eat the three or four weeks without him, and then come week twelve, whatever, on we got Jones. And we, after this Detroit game, the schedule for Minnesota does lighten up a little yeah, bit. We're so Aaron Jones is so just going to be active this week, and none of this is going to fucking yeah, matter you, for sure. Last year too, especially like he uh, didn't look great. Then he got hurt. He missed an extended period of time, and he actually started to look very good quietly the last few weeks. Right. So. He could benefit from extra time if needed. Yeah. All right. Well, we got to keep moving here because there are so many messy running back situations in the fucking NFL right now. We got Chase mm -hmm. Brown who overtook the starting role from Cincinnati. I still think the Zach Moss ankle thing is weird. I still think he's playing at far less than 100%. He looks awful, but he's kind of looked kind of bad all year, and Chase Brown has looked really explosive. So yeah. he's an RB2 for sure. James Cook, we get to the Buffalo situation. He 
I like I I picked up Ray Davis and Yuri Lee Mace on Saturday. <laughs> I dropped him on Sunday because here's here here are the reports. Like James Cook got in a limited practice, yeah. and then he was like, "I'm playing Monday." So I was like, "Okay, if James Cook is if James Cook is playing, Ray Davis probably doesn't have much to him." Then there were reports like, "All right, Kendrick Miller is going to be activated for the first time this year." So I was like, "All right, I'm just take a shot on him instead of the dude who's going to be the backup now, even though Kendrick is fucking a backup." Kendrick inactive, uh, James Cook inactive, Ray Davis explodes. Like that's fantasy football in a motherfucking nutshell. But we have Ray Davis <laughs> break out for 23 touches, 150 total yards, whatever. James Cook uh, dealing with a turf-ish toe injury. It, it seems the fact that he got in a limit, limited limited practice on Saturday he can go tells me he's week. trending towards the right direction but I also don't feel that that's a definite by any stretch now yeah the fact that Ray Davis played the way that he played might make it to where you're like eh, take one more week James maybe I, I don't know that NFL teams really look at it that way I still think they want their best players on the field at all times agreed um but it, it but Ray it's hard to argue how good he looked great I yes. mean I think the thing with Cook is I could look at it. You can see it both ways where you get a limited. You're really close. Maybe just not this week. And he's practicing Thursday and we're good. But sometimes it's like, all right, you gave it a go. You thought you're going to be better and you got out there and it, you're, it's really feeling. Yeah. Tough. The turf toes linger too. Yeah. And that's the thing for me with him where it's like, maybe he should take a week off. I don't know. He'll have to listen to his body and figure that out. But it's like, if, if Ray Davis in that role, he ends up on the, after the game presser, it's him and Scott Van Pelt up there. Like, yeah. the dude bald. Yeah. What do you guys so, take of, there's a lot of takes in the fantasy world at the moment right now saying that Ray Davis has earned more touches in this backfield. And now maybe it's a little bit messier with James Cook here. He's not being the bell cow that he was before. Do you think that there's a real legitimate chance that Ray Davis is a part-time role now? Yeah. I, I think you'd be... It'd be crazy to not to see him go back to relegated to almost nothing, but I I don't know that I'm super worried about it if James Cook is actually active and healthy. I think the one the one um, one thing I will say just to be cognizant of is the Jets' run defense is horrible. They're like actually graded 31st per PFF in run defense. I think people still have that like mindset of the Jets have an elite defense. No, they have an elite secondary. secondary. They don't have an elite yeah. defense overall. Their run D has been awful. Like we, do you remember Week One watching them when Jordan Mason? The holes are insane that running backs get and Ray Davis enjoyed that all fucking night there was he, he was making guys miss for sure and he looked great no doubt about it I don't want to take it away but there was uh, a Catching lot of yards deep balls downfield that was like, incredible yeah. yeah there were yards to be had by any running back in that backfield so I don't want to get like too crazy and I think if James Cook does miss this game and Ray Davis is playing versus Tennessee that matchup is a thousand times more difficult yeah. you're obviously going to start him as like an RB2 but don't expect 150 yards from scrimmage when James mm-hmm. Cook is back like it's James Cook's job. You know, like what I was saying with the Ravens, right. the, their defense, when they're game planning for the Bills, we're not looking at receivers. We're looking at James Cook. We're looking at James Cook running routes out of the backfield. Yeah. I, I, Ray Davis' snap share might go up a little bit, but I, I don't – it's James Cook's – You earn some touches, though, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, speaking of earning touches, role? we've got everybody in the Tampa Bay backfield getting some touches here. we got Bucky Irving going oh. for 100 yards and a touchdown last week. we got Sean Tucker going for 600 yards and six touchdowns last week. He was the number one player in fantasy, the number one running back in fantasy last week. They play Baltimore this week, insanely tough run defense. Uh, Rashad White missed the game, obviously. We don't have a practice report yet. Uh, I was just reading on Twitter. We won't get one until Thursday, unfortunately, so we don't really know Rashad White's status. Yeah. My take on this is I genuinely think when Rashad White is back, Sean Tucker becomes pretty irrelevant for fantasy again. Yeah. Uh, they I'm, trust Rashad White pass protecting. They trust him in passing situations. Tucker was, obviously, was also doing that like in you know third, fourth quarter when they're up 20 points against the fucking Saints. Absolutely diminished defense. I think Bucky won the starting role, though. I think it's Bucky's backfield with Rashad White getting 40% of the touches now when he's back there. I think Sean probably did earn uh, a, a handful of touches now going forward a game, somewhere yeah. in like the four to six range. Bulls even said, you know, that he could see this being a three-man committee at this point. I like Bucky a lot more than the other two. I agree. I, I don't think it's close. I, I think... Uh, I don't like any of them. <laughs> well, I w- then on that sentiment, I might go try to buy Bucky. If, if you were like a Bucky owner and you're like, I don't like him, I, I foresee a three-headed backfield, I'm nervous about what happens in the future, I'm going to buy Bucky then. Sean yeah. Tucker is like, uh, the crazy part is we, you had that type of week, and typically it's like you now you're expecting more. For fantasy, I think he needs Rashad White to stay hurt or, or Bucky to get hurt. To ha- he's, he's very likely going to go back to 20, 15, 10% snaps, and you don't put him in lineups um, for sure if he's not at least just him and Bucky. Bucky, though, to me, especially in this Baltimore matchup, Baltimore, the one problem is they've been dominating time of possession and just absolutely kicking 
team's teeth in, like insanely. Yeah. But I also think they play ahead a lot. And I feel like Bucky could be in a spot where you get a lot of Baker Mayfield attempts to him late Maybe. in the game too. I think Bucky's the pass catching back for sure if it's just him and, um, and Sean Tucker. Tucker. I don't know. I, the Rashad White injury news, I keep trying to find more. It seems, again, you can't find a whole lot of information about where it is this week. If Bucky Irvin's playing without Rashad White this week, I actually kind of like him as a definite RB2 with maybe a little bit of PPR upside. Yeah. I I just don't like the matchup. Um, where I have him right now at 31 is definitely uh, pretty pessimistic, I think. But I'm also baking into the fact uh, that I am going to project Rashad White to play. Obviously, like you said, Nick, we're not going to get any real news until tomorrow. But... If Rashad White is back, I think the PPR upside you're talking about kind of diminishes. Yeah, this this ranking to me right now is uh, is with White out. With White out, if yeah. he if he's playing, I think for this week especially in this matchup, I'm probably avoiding the backfield if I can. Yeah. yeah. What about what about the next guy up on this list, Tank Bigsby? Because Travis Etienne pulled his hammy and he's likely going to be out. But we saw that the Ernest Johnson is the clear pass catching back in this offense. Tank Bigsby has one single target on the season which is insane for the amount of snaps that he's played so far. Now, they get New England. They're in London. Um, I don't think New England's run D is anything that you need to be too scared of. They're pretty soft. They're pretty soft. Uh, the Jaguars will be favorites in this game. The game script definitely leans more towards Tank than Dearness Johnson this time around. So I think I think Tank is a dude that I'm not like overly excited about, I guess, to get in my lineup, but he's definitely someone that I would consider starting this week. Yeah, the way actually we feel very different about Bucky and Tank, but I feel the way about Tank the way you feel about Bucky. Yeah. I think he's a guy that I can plug in as an RB2 this week and feel okay about it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I, I love Tank Bigsby, honestly. It's hard to admit. Like, him playing at Auburn, I really liked his, him all along. He didn't get the draft capital that you probably wanted on top of the fact that he went to the backfield with ETN. It's like, what are we doing here? I mean, third-round draft capital was pretty damn good This for was him. a guy that was being talked in the same breath, though, as the guys that went – Really early. So yeah. um, more, more so from the point now where Tank Bigsby and ETN were at the point this year where the efficiency for Tanks went way up, ETN it hasn't. So you're like, all right, is this going to be a split where Tank can take the job over? Well, ETN leaves in 60% of the snaps. is literally 56% of the snaps go to Dearness Johnson. You're watching this London game like, can't be serious. Where, where is Tank Bigsby? So uh, to me, I'm not saying that the positive game strips won't come where that would maybe switch more in his favor, but anytime there's a two-minute drill, like we're probably not seeing Tank. It, yeah. it just, I think his upside to me, unfortunately, we saw the scenario where it could have happened for sure with an injury to um, ETN, and it was like, damn. Like, I don't know. It took a lot of wind out of my sails, frankly. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think these types of weeks, though, are the ones you have to capitalize on because in games where they get their shit beat out of them, yeah. Tank's not going to play much. But in games where we're expecting them to be in, I think Tank's probably... like Because between Tank and ETN from weeks like one through five or whatever, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they probably combined for 20, 22, 24 touches or something like that between the two of them, where I think most of those just go to Tank now. So I think Tank will probably get like 18 carries. If he happens to get lucky on the goal line a couple of times, you're looking at you know 18 for 90 and two touchdowns, then you're like, fuck, Tank's kind of... I I'll, I guess to that point real quick, I would just say that I, I agree, except for my, I guess my counter or my, my pessimism comes from, is Jacksonville really that good? Are we ever going to see like really great game scripts from them? They look terrible, man. That's the other fair. problem. I don't, I don't love the offense. I, yeah, expect, they're, I was they're expecting a lot more. They're, they're a team where like, even when they're expected to win, I don't, I don't uh, feel comfortable that like the game script is going to play out that way. I right. will say I would, I would be more surprised this week if Tank finished outside of the top 30 than if he finished inside of the top 15. I feel more comfortable saying he finishes in the top 15 than he is outside of the top 30. That's a good way to look at it. I probably agree with that. That's interesting. Yeah. All right, let's keep moving down, though. We got Alexander Madison. We've got Tyrone Tracy at 29, another backfield I think we got to talk about a little bit. Tyrone Tracy has just been incredible Dog. the last couple of weeks while Devin Singletary's been out. Uh, I don't know that we've gotten an update on Singletary's groin injury right now. Let's say he comes back this week. Because he was active. I th uh, he was limited in practice for, like, multiple practices last week. So, it is definitely trending towards him being back this week. Tracy, at this point, like, it feels like he has to have earned a 50-50 share at minimum. Singletary should just stay out I for the rest of his that. life. My, Dayball loves him, and he played well in the beginning of the season. So, I don't think he's going away. <laughs> yeah, my, my ranking of 31 is kind of like, I monitored it all last week. I was putting him in my rankings like it's going to be a split, and then he doesn't play. I think he does play this week. So, and if he plays... I hate to say this because I think you're 100 percent right, Andrew. Like, can you just stay out for a little yeah. bit? Single. Tracy's the better running back. I I believe he is the better running back. 
I hope I I want to say the same thing. You probably right. I'm, I've never really been the biggest biggest Devin Singletary fan, um, but I I don't think it matters for fantasy. If, if I don't think Devin Singletary is going to go to the wayside. I think to your point, no. it's probably more like a fifty fifty split for the best case. It, scenario it could for just crazy. be a like a Bucky Rashad White uh, situation where it's like I think Tyron Tracy is probably the Bucky Irving in in this spot. Now the Giants' offense they've obviously outperformed. I think where we thought they were going to be in the beginning of the year for sure. Offensive line have played better, but they just lost Andrew Thomas for the season, yeah. which is a huge fucking hit to the offensive line. The the floor weeks are going to come for both running backs for sure. But like Tracy obviously offers a ton more upside if Devin Singletary ends up re-injuring the groin or whatever happens. Like Tracy could be a league winner down the yeah. stretch. And this matchup is pretty middle of the pack. Philadelphia they they haven't been great, but they haven't been bad yeah. uh, against running backs. So I I think all in all I, I'm viewing this right now as if. Singletary is back, and this is a split, and that's why I have him where I have him. But uh, I do lean Tracy over Singletary for fantasy football purposes, at least this week. Yeah, so it, you got Tracy 29. I was just going to say, if, if Anderson, so we're both having him here as a uh, – he's splitting it. What if he was not? What if they ruled Singletary out? How, how far are we pushing him up? Um, I would – I'd probably put him in that uh, – I mean, hell, how high can I go? Right, um, top 15. That's maybe? what I was, I was just going to say. I think it's a lot for me. Like, I think I'm putting him in the conversation with, like, Kareem Hunt, James Conner, Devon H. And, like, that's yeah. why I move him there. And, really, if you look at the last two weeks, when he's been the starting running back, he has two top ten finishes at the running back position. So, obviously, a little bit lighter matchups than It's nice to one, see, like, a guy where you're like, all right, he's finally on paper in a great opportunity. He's got a lot of talent. And then he just continues to come through for you. Yeah, like, two top just, ten finishes. Yeah. What else can you ask for? So, I yeah. think for me, I would, I'd probably move him as far as – Hunt and I would, Connor. I think Hunt's a perfect one. That's where I was going to go because uh, Hunt's getting the majority of the touches, and I think Tyron Tracy had no reason not to get the majority of touches if no Singletary again. Yep. All right. Well, I, I kind of think the rest of the players outside of one player are all like, you're not going to start them unless the guy in front of them is hurt. Like, they all change. Like, Ray Davis obviously moves up. Ty Chandler moves up if their starting running backs are out. Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. Same thing with Antonio Gibson. Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb is making his return this <laughs> week. We have him consensus 31. Andrew, you've got him at 25. You've got yeah. him down at 37. They play Cincinnati. A lot of moving parts here. Jerome Ford likely going to be out week to week with a hamstring injury. Um, this will be Nick Chubb's first activation and play since, you know, the knee the injury knee last injury. year. Yeah. Deonta Foreman filled in a little bit. Pierre Strong filled in a little bit. Now, this Cleveland offense is in absolute disarray, free fall, shambles, how, whatever synonyms you want to throw out there. Couldn't have looked worse. Uh, the Cincinnati defense has been bad, but they are starting to now get their D tackles back healthy, and they played a lot better last week after, like, a players-only defensive meeting. How long does that last or work for? I don't know. I will just say what I said before. I don't think there's a world where Nick Chubb touches my lineup this week. I understand, but at the same time, <laughs> I'm looking at this list of running backs here, and we're talking about guys like Tank Bixby, Alexander Madison, Javante Williams, and I'm looking at Nick freaking Chubb, and I'm like, why the hell not throw him into the lineup? Because in all honesty, I understand the data, the injury risk, all of the stuff of like, don't give Nick Chubb those touches. I don't think Nick Chubb gives a shit. I think Nick Chubb wants to run the rock. I think they don't really have a choice. Jerome Ford not going to play. I know, you know, you, they can get cute with Dante Foreman and stuff like that. Nick Chubb is the identity of this offense. He always has been. He's been the heart and soul of the Cleveland Browns. I know that the argument sounds narrative-based, but I just can't imagine. It's vibe-based. It's vibe-based vibe for sure. I cannot imagine that they just don't give Nick Chubb the damn rock this week. And I know, I don't think he's going to be that great with the football in his hands, but the volume, and when we're talking about guys like Bucky and Tank and these other guys, just give me Nick Chubb. I, I mean, I there's just no chance I'm putting Nick Chubb in my lineup over Tank this week without ETN. No shot in <laughs> hell. I will say, like... How many touches is Nick Chubb going to get? In all fairness, week? I do have him You're the Browns fan, so... Uh, Nick Chubb... Tank Bigsby thing aside, let's not let's. I don't yeah. want to go back down that path. Nick Chubb is. I got a hang signed jersey of him. As soon as I got that, he got the terrible knee injury from Pittsburgh. Like that was 13, 13 months. You got to stop ago. buying jerseys. Size. I didn't. I, I never actually. That's I, what happens when you're a Browns fan, though. They just like fucking. You could definitely attribute it to me or just the entire team. Yeah, but you buy the things. Cooper jersey and then he's traded the Chubb. Chubb jersey, was just like injured. hanging up signed memorabilia. But you, maybe mm. you're onto something. Maybe it's me or let me know what jerseys you buy next. <laughs> the thing is with Chubb, though, honestly, like he's I love him. If you're a Browns fan, you know how like it's hard to quantify a guy being that good that is not 
in any way, shape, or form, uh, like Barry Sanders of old, just literally hand the ball to refs, has no human emotion. Like good a good stuff here. Get to <laughs> us telling us why we're not starting him. You're not playing. I don't care what the good vibes are. Like, there's no good vibes on this team. They just traded away the only like player that was get, getting the ball targeted to them a lot. He wasn't doing anything with it either. There's this offensive line is also in. When I talk about shambles, I, I would I would argue this offensive line right now in its current state might be some of the worst we've seen in the last 30 years dude. that that's another good point because Nick Chubb has always run behind a, a good line a top five offensive line in Cleveland. when when the Browns were really actually going from absolutely terrible to like in the playoff hunt their trenches were the reason yep. they really started to establish the the offensive line All, like everyone on the offensive line is hurting when you think it can't get worse we get Nick Harris carted off last week like yeah. it's I just worry a guy that he said uh, it was really hard. Like, it sounds like it was a tough injury for him to come out, come out of emotionally. This guy that did have a lot of uh, injuries in his past at Georgia. First week back, and you are going to be seeing probably not a single opening. Like, it's a tough scene. How many how many touches do you predict for Chubb? I, I was going to look at underdog. Where does underdog Let's have? make – Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. All right, you do that. I'm, I'm going to give you what I think. I think we should all make a prediction here. Okay, I like this game. I'm – Dude, I'm I think going, you should before you look. We should. I'm make not looking at it yet. Okay. okay, I'm going over 15. Really? I'm going over 15. Man, how? I guess. Okay, so because if if to the point you're making, if he gets 15 touches this week, like if he actually comes back from this injury looking like a very good football player still, and then also in this offensive situation can overcome that, Nick Chubb is he defies every odd. What's out your there. prediction this week? I'd say. I'm in the range of like ten. I'm gonna go ten times. I was, I was gonna say ten, but I'll I'll fuck it. I'll ride the pessimistic train because I've been doing it all, all right. summer. I'll yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I'll take the lower of ten. He's gonna say six. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say uh, like so if I get ten uh, on the nose, I have. I was a gonna chance. say ten to uh, eight to ten. Underdog does not have a projection. Okay. Let me, yeah. Uh, the the other thing is I'm like looking somewhere else real quick. Okay, so Cleveland actually Stefanski has always had since he's number, and they normally dominate these games, but I just can't see it. This Cleveland team dominating anybody. There's, there's not another. There's not anything anywhere. There's not a book anywhere. There's, I don't no. think the books want any part of that type of a line. Um, well, be. if it comes out and it's anywhere even remotely below, like I will take the over on that anywhere from like twelve up. I mean, I mean twelve or below. Like if they have the line at twelve attempts or something. The, the problem is with it. Like when you, they're setting a line trying to get people to bet on both sides. I don't know that is they put that for line sure out. back this week. Like definite. Uh, it sounds so, optimistic, but it's not 100%. Okay. He made a pretty big like Instagram post comment announcement, basically insinuating that the return of Chubb is now. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 I think it's going to happen this week. Uh, if it's not, he's very close to returning. He, he, yeah, to Andrew's point, he's been... But look, first, man, the first, that's the first we've heard of him in a while. Though. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll hear your argument, and you know what? I'll Let's pump the brakes. I'll... I'll Nope, you're locked in at 15. I, I'm not, I don't want you to – no, 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 no. Give me the you're fight. You're locked in at 17. I was, I was fight, more so talking about my ranking. So I'll pull him down a little bit. But I'll tell you okay. what, I'm still not moving him below a guy like Javante Williams, who I have at 30. I don't, I'm not moving him below Bucky Irving against Baltimore at 31. Like, I, I'm still going to have him in the top 28, 29. It's going to so, be wild to see how this plays out. I'll move him a couple down, <laughs> but here we are. I hear you on Javante. I also – it's so gross, but I watched this New Orleans team get. Uh, we just talked about Tucker and them, like yeah. kind of just get gaped. Yeah. I don't think Javante is all that great anymore, and he's not getting that much work. But that, well, that matchup's a halfway decent one. I it, feel like it does get to a tier where it's like you get to. For me, I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, tank volume, Madison volume, and then it gets. It, it's not necessarily like who are the next few best, like where I put Chubb. It's just like all guys that I want no part of. Like there's a tier of 15 dudes. I'm just like, no, like no. It, yeah. it, I'll just this is the point I guess about the offensive line and the team in general. Last year, early on when Nick Chubb was out there, he was playing great, right? And then we're you see that gruesome injury and you're like, okay, their their run game is shot. Jerome Ford was killing last year. Jerome Ford has been horrible. I don't think I it's on Jerome him. Ford. I dropped him this week. I don't think it's on Jerome Ford as much as it is like I don't think there's a lot of running backs in the NFL healthy that are going to come in and do very well with this situation. It's shitty as hell in Cleveland right now. Yeah, it's it's bad all around there. Nick which Chubb's is, the Messiah. I mean, I, I want to believe you're right. I, I Honestly, I hope you are. I really do. I hope I am too, but maybe for confident. selfish reasons. Let's see where they run. Their run blocking grade oh. offensive line is like, 30th. So, like, Wyatt nice. Teller, okay, is unbelievable in pooling situations and a great run block. He's hurt. Every, everybody on the offensive line is basically hurt. It's terrible. Yeah, that's yeah. It's just too much to overcome. 
Go to Even G- if their offensive line was top five right now, I don't know that I'd be confident. In like Nick the Chubb. odds that are stacked against Nick Chubb right now are so ridiculous. If he was to succeed, like he's just him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, the it's it's a very deep. You know, he, you're saying he should be deep in our rankings, so I think that should take us to deep cuts. Let's go for it. W. So deep cuts for me at the running back position this week. Uh, actually, who did I have? I don't even remember. So deep, I can't even remember off the top of my <laughs> Way head. Way down there. Talking about deep cuts, uh, I am actually going to be going with Jalen Warren of the Pittsburgh Steelers this week. He comes in as running back 43. He gets a matchup against the New York Jets. We talked a little bit, Nick, earlier where you said the Jets are pretty easy to run against at times. Also, they've been very vulnerable to giving receptions to the running back position. I'm also baking in the fact that I do believe it's going to be Russell Wilson, and with Russell Wilson under center, he is going to more likely be checking the football down to their primary pass catching back in Jalen Warren. I think all of these are adding up to where if you need to get freaky, you need to get nasty, Jalen Warren is one of the guys that you can do that all with. All right, Dan. <laughs> Dang. Hey, yo. Man. Well, I will say that, like, last week I was like, all right, I want no part of Najee, and he had – Two plays is like the M and M's commercial. They do exist. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I don't know. Maybe maybe it will be Jalen Warren. I'm not. I don't feel very confident. But we're talking deep cuts at RB, so I don't feel very confident in any of these players. If I have to pick one, it is going to be the guy that is all of a sudden on the screen way too much. Dearness Johnson, mm. because while you could say that Tank Bigsby is in a situation versus New England offense or defense, I'm sorry to do well. I've seen Jacksonville look really putrid, and if they're behind. Dearness Johnson might be getting a fair amount of touches again. If you're in a spot where you're desperate, pass catching role from Dearness Johnson to from Trevor Lawrence might not be that bad. Yeah, I, th- I think um, where I'm going here is I'm going to attack the in- Indianapolis situation because I do expect Jonathan Taylor to miss a game. <sighs> Trey Sermon's gotten a ton of work. He's obviously looked bad. He'll get the goal line work, but Goodson looks like he's kind of shot out of a cannon. It's almost like Chase Brown versus Zach Moss out there in Indy, and they got a really good matchup against – Miami, uh, if A. Rich is back under center, I think it opens things up for the run game. So I kind of like Tyler Goodson here as as a deep cut, as a guy who's going to catch some passes and, and be uh, an important part of the offense. Trey Sermon got a little banged up in that game too, no? He did. I think he did. I, he did, but I don't, I don't think he's going to miss time. Okay. I was going to say, if there's any sneaky chance of, of Goodson being out there without Taylor and mm. Sermon, oh my God. It doesn't sound like it. I feel like we would have seen them activate like Evan Hull or something if he got. Yeah, probably something like that. All right, well, that's going to take it away for the top 40 running back rankings for week seven. If you missed the wide receiver version of it, we will put the video up here. That went out a couple hours ago. If you want to see next week's and all the weeks going forward, subscribe to the channel, and you can become a big dog member on bdge.co. Cheapest way to get the membership for the entire rest of the season is by going to Underdog Fantasy, the app, downloading it using that code right there, which is probably cut off on the screen, actually, but it's BDG, all right? Everything BDG. Every URL you go to, every website you go to, just type BDG in the promo code spot. You'll probably get a discount if you got it like that. BDG is right? like that. <laughs> we out. Thank.